This is Don't Call It Small, and I'm your host, Natasha Foreman. Welcome. If you don't know about me and you have no clue what this podcast is all about, let me share a bit. I'm the CEO of Foreman Associates LLC, and Don't Call It Small is where we talk all things business. Sharing news and tips that you can use and highlight the people and ideas behind the products and services that we buy. To learn more about me and my company, please visit ForemanLLC.com. Ah, it's Wednesday, September 11th. Um, there's so much to share. Let me... Um, Let me start off by thanking everyone who sent their well wishes and prayers to me. I'm feeling much better than last week, especially these past few days. Ironically, the humidity here in Georgia has been an absolute blessing. It's helped clear my congestion so I breathe much easier. But it has been a rough two weeks. All right, enough about that. Let's move along. Um, Today is my maternal grandfather's birthday. Yes, indeed. My papa. Um... Ellisbury would have been, this would have been his 95th birthday today. He transitioned from this life in 1995, so 95 and 95. And his presence is dearly missed. I've never known a man quite like my grandfather. There's not a day that goes by when his presence and love is not felt and cherished. Happy birthday, Papa. I love and miss you so very much. Today is also the 18th anniversary of the gruesome attack on the United States by forces not fully known to the public. My prayers go out to that everyone um, directly and indirectly impacted by this painful experience. May wrongs be righted and, and that it may somehow justice can bring closure to those whose loved ones passed away on that day and days after. I send loving prayers to them and to all of you. Let's have a moment of silence, if you wouldn't mind, for um, in memory of everyone that was impacted for the loved ones that are no longer here. Thank you for that. All right, now let's talk business. Are you guys ready to talk business? I am. In business... There are four functions of management that are always utilized. There is planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Planning states the intended goals and the why, when, where, and how those goals will be met. If you want to take a trip, you need a plan. If you want to start or grow a business, you need a plan. If you need to overhaul your business, guess what? You need a plan. Organizing is the process of pooling your resources and aligning everyone and everything that is needed to make the plan succeed. The goal to reach the goals, right? And leading is exactly what it sounds like. You need to motivate, inspire, encourage, and rally whomever is part of your team to make your dreams come true. Every and all plans need one or more leaders guiding the processes. That then leaves us with the function of control. Now, this doesn't mean aggression or abuse, and it also doesn't mean Janet Jackson's song control, since that's usually the first thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> The management function of control is simply the tracking and measuring of your progress towards achieving goals, seeing how far you're on target or you deviate. It's the reports used to track inventory, production, sales, so on and so forth. It's comparing the GPS or roadmap with the street and highway signs to determine if you're on course or off course and whether you're on time or behind schedule. There are countless business examples that I can share today where these four functions were blundered by a company, but the one that I've selected to discuss is one that has resurfaced in the news on American Greed and on both Netflix and Hulu. Yeah, let's talk about the fumbled, jumbled business model that led to the disaster once called the Fire Festival. Do you remember the Fire Festival? (laughs) Oh, gosh. Uh, I shouldn't laugh. Um... It's just, uh, uh, anyway. Fire Festival is a fraudulent luxury music festival founded by Billy McFarlane, who uh, was serving as the CEO of Fire Media Incorporated and rapper Ja Rule. And it was created with the intent of promoting the company's Fire app for booking music talent, 
But festival goers weren't privy to that latter fact until after all of this foolishness aired through interviews and investigative reporting months after the festival blew up in the faces of of McFarland and Ja Rule. So Fire Festival, if you don't know, was promoted as being a bigger, better, bolder, and more luxe than all um, the other festivals combined. And it was to be held in the Bahamas after roughly four months of active planning and preparation. Now, you don't need to have a background in event planning to know that a festival of this caliber will need to take more than four months to execute successfully. And for those of us with event planning experience, we know that it takes more like 18 to 24 months to plan and execute an event of this magnitude. So it was quoted as being a half built on chaos. (laughs) That's not a good foundation, right? Being half built on chaos. The festival was to last two weekends. It was it claimed to be the best in food, art, music, and adventure. It was supposed to be on the island once owned by Pablo Escobar and on the boundaries of the impossible. And fire is supposed to be an experience and festival to push beyond those boundaries. That was the quest. And so they had promo videos that sold people on being flown round trip on a custom VIP configured Boeing 737 aircraft. And guests would be staying in modern, um, eco-friendly, these geodesic domes, and they'd unplug from the everyday and ignite their flame, right, there in the Bahamas. Well, in the months leading up to the festival, Fire Media paid numerous celebrities and influencers to, you know, really, you know, go about touting the festival and um, talking about how great it was going to be. And they used their social media accounts. And it was also reported that Kendall Jenner was um, paid $250,000 for just one Instagram post that she sent out to more than her 100 million followers. Is (laughs) <laughs> that's how much that they wanted to get this this festival buzzworthy and um, raise the attention and, of course, get thousands of people to attend. So what's ironic about that is guess who wasn't at the festival? Mm, yeah, Kendall Jenner. So people, of course, were assuming that she was going to be there and if Kendall Jenner is going to be there, that means her brother-in-law, Kanye West, would be there, right? That's what people are tying together. And the Los Angeles Times reported in January 2017 um, that pla- that passes for the festival, which included accommodations and a chartered flight from Miami, were starting um, at $1,595. And, but they stretched to the extreme of almost $400,000, which would include, you know, a dinner with a performer. And... Um, but NPR had also interviewed different attendees who said that that they could all, that they were able to purchase tickets for as little as nine hundred dollars, and from what the reports show is that the initially when the team the fire media team they initially were doing these nine hundred dollar tickets and when they realized that people were really trying to consume those versus the higher end tickets, they shut down the nine hundred dollar tickets so that you'd have to buy the the pricier tickets. Well. Festival goers assumed they were going to be getting these high end accommodations when actually they got half built amenities. Um, tents that looked more like FEMA tents. Um, there was talk about um, feral dogs and that the food, this luxury food, um, if you want to call it, <laughs> was cold cheese sandwiches. Now, if you want to call them cold cheese sandwiches, that's okay. But if we're going to be literal, they were given styrofoam containers with one slice of cheese on on top of one slice of bread. And it was garnished with a, you can barely call it a salad, right? After being promised local seafood and Bahamian style sushi and a pig roast. Yeah. So none of that uh, (laughs) took place. And there was no security or staff to really help the thousands of people who arrived and found themselves stranded. But, but they had plenty of liquor to numb themselves. Yeah. Um, a handful of attendees did get their super expensive villas they pay for, but many others didn't. And many people who had paid thousands of dollars found themselves outside without anything to sleep on. Um, the festival didn't have all of those tents assembled. And that meant that not all of the mattresses had been unpacked and placed in the tents. 
So speaking of unpacking, how do you expect your luggage to be transported and delivered to you? If you're going to this festival, this Lux festival, how do you think your luggage would be transported and delivered, especially after you paid thousands of dollars for the event? I know you wouldn't expect them to be thrown out of the back of a truck onto the ground for you to try to sort through. Yeah, that's what happened. But why shouldn't you think that since the organizers transported most of their attendees on yellow school buses after delaying and redirecting them to other parts of the island to try to give their crew more time to finish setting up those tents? Um, Attendees were promised yacht rides with gorgeous models, performances from the likes of Blink-182, um, rappers Pusha T, Tyga, Migos, um, what is it, Major Lazer, and so many more. Which is funny since Fire Media never paid the artist at all or any of the money that was required to secure the booking. I don't know if they thought that people would just somehow show up and perform just because it was Ja Rule. I don't know. On paper, the festival looked and sounded really good, but it turned out to be worse than crap. And there's no other better word to use in that. And so, of course, social media had a field day with this. Um, they started using hashtags, you know, creating different ha- hashtags. And um, this actually, um, for a lot of reasons, why it never became that known for a lot of people, because people looked at this, certain people looked at this as just being rich people's problems, because who could, you know, what average person can afford a you know, 1500, let alone a 15,000 or a $50,000 price tag, except someone with some money or someone willing to sell all of their worldly possessions. So when you pay tons of money to be surrounded by um, shipping containers and white igloo like tents and porta potties, I mean, you, you, you definitely didn't get your money's worth. So, I mean, porta potties, if I, I, I don't even want to pay five hundred dollars and end up with a porta potty. Like it's just not happening. So you also had people that were conned into uploading funds to a wristband to use at the festival. They were told that rather than bringing cash, they just upload these funds and then use their wristbands. And they were told that these bands would allow them to eat and drink, you know, without having to be concerned about shelling out extra money. But here's the thing: the cost of the festival was already supposed to cover food and drinks. So what was the real use of the bracelets? Mm -hmm. Let's be what later was discovered um, in the various documentaries is that fire festival didn't budget and forecast properly. So they ran out of money about two months before the festival schedule dates. So they had to make up that gap and convince attendees to pay for the bracelets. And what do you think these old amazing bracelets got them when they arrived in the Bahamas? Absolutely nothing. Yep. Yep. So, um, and the tie into that is because people didn't bring cash or anything because they thought everything I've paid for everything. I now have this bracelet. I'm good to go. That meant that people were unable to purchase basic transportation for taxis or buses, which only accept cash. Now there is a lawsuit and a hundred million dollar lawsuit that says that defendants had been aware for months that their festival was dangerously under equipped Um, The island was totally barren and that the few contractors that had been retained were refusing work because they hadn't been paid. So, yeah, even the workers weren't compensated. And um, McFarland, he responded in an interview with Rolling Stone by saying that they started this website and launched the festival marketing campaign. And our festival became a real thing and took on a life of its own. And our next step was to book up the talent and actually make the music festival. And then we went out excited and that's when a lot of reality and roadblocks hit. We were a little naive and thinking for the first time we could do this ourselves. Next year, we will definitely start earlier. Um, (laughs) If you know anything about Fire Festival, next year never came up. Nope. McFarlane was arrested by the FBI. He went to court. He's now serving a six-year prison sentence for committing fraud, not only against the festival goers, but also the investors that invested millions into this dream. Um, He defrauded over a hundred investors out of more than $26 million. um, He made repeated uh, misrepresentations about the business. He lied to them about how much money he had placed into the festival 
And he told them that the company was already worth at least $90 million, which it wasn't. He also lied to investors, telling them that they would have the right to a payout should the festival be canceled, when in fact, he hadn't secured can- <laughs> he hadn't secured no cancellation insurance policies. So, yeah. You know, we have to sit back and say, you know, what happened? How did this happen? And clearly, they failed in properly and effectively planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. So let's back up and break it all down. First, they never officially partnered with the Bahamas Ministry of Tourism to gain a better understanding of planning and organizing needs. Had they done this, then they would have never scheduled the festival when they did because they ignorantly planned the festival during the same time the country hosts a huge annual boating event, which gobbled up travel accommodations and other resources tied to the island. Had they been asked, the Office of Tourism would have advised them to plan for later in the year or sometime the following year, but of course, not during their most busiest months. They also would have directed them to the right resources for securing the site for the festival. Instead, Billy McFarlane, Ja Rule, and the crew, clearly, clearly they thought they could just buy an island like you buy a hot dog from the New York City vendor on the corner. Uh, the island that McFarlane et al. promised in their promo videos and social media posts was nothing close to what the festival goers arrived to. It was basically on the back lot of the neighboring hotel's resort. Um, there was no beach, no luxury. Their third, fourth, and fifth mistake (laughs) was that their team should have brought in professional event producers and planners in the very beginning to help them with planning, budget, and logistics, but they didn't. They waited to advise event producers after they had already started promoting the festival and getting ticket sales. So once they spoke with the event production team, they were told that the team would need at least 18 months to deliver a festival of this caliber, but Do you think that McFarlane and his team contemplated postponing or rescheduling the festival? Mm, Nope. So they went full steam ahead anyway, and the production team was told to just get it done and that, you know, McFarlane believed they could do it. (sighs) Who knows? So a few weeks before the festival took place, McFarlane's company defaulted on nearly a $3 million loan. Um, The lender EHL Funding filed a lawsuit to, to reclaim that money. While a potential investment from Comcast Ventures that was worth up to $20 million fell through at the last minute. And um, the venture capital firm said that it had passed on the investment after they had done some due diligence on their own. So with a lack of actual capital, Fire Media, which by then um, they had already booked, I think, a little over 57000 in revenue between May 2016 and April 2017. Right. So they only had about 57,000 in revenue, yet they were claiming to be a 98 $98 million dollar company. Um, They were forced to cut corners on the festival. They cut a lot of corners. Right. They went from a square into a a, a circle real fast. Um, So they stiffed a lot of the vendors who had done work um, from the on-site construction to event planning and marketing. And, you know, McFarland promised they'd be paid once the investments came in, but he knew they weren't going to come in. And so this is what happens when you have a combination of ego and greed that get in the way. The festival co-organizers, McFarland and Ja Rule, now still have this $100 million lawsuit. Um, It's a class action lawsuit that was filed initially by a disgruntled festival grower. And then, of course, they have the $26 million in restitution that McFarland has to repay investors and customers he defrauded. And then he reached a settlement with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission over fraud charges in July 2018 when he agreed that he would accept a lifetime ban. Um, He could never serve as a director or officer of a public company. Of course, as you know, there's always loop-de-loops around that. Um... (laughs) And knowing him, he's going to get out of prison and try to find a loophole with that. The Bahamian workers who slaved away for months are still unpaid for their labor. So, you know, the question is, what about them? Um, But something interesting is this. Guess who's been banned from the Bahamas? They cannot come to the Bahamas. If you said McFarland and Ja Rule, you are correct. Now, Ja Rule claims that he was bamboozled and hoodwinked. Those were his words, not mine, um, by McFarland. And there's video footage however, of him on the show, um, Vlad, where he's bragging about being the mastermind and brainchild of the fire Festival. 
And he claimed that it was all his idea. So, Ja, I don't know. You, you know, you better hope that that footage isn't used in the $100 million lawsuit. Or better yet, please, please, please don't proceed with your plans for your so-called new Icon app, which sounds oh so familiar to the Fire app that you and McFarlane were pitching in 2017. I mean, according to an interview with TMZ, Ja Rule said that, this is this is quoted from him, in the midst of chaos, there's opportunity. The goal is to launch a festival in the same vein as Fire Festival, but functional. Fire is the most iconic festival that never was. I have plans to create the iconic music festival, but you didn't hear it from me. Now, he didn't provide too many details about Icon, the app, but Ja Rule said that it's an amazing platform designed for artists and that it's kind of similar to what the Fire app was, but you have to understand the app was separate from the festival. That's what he told TMZ. And then he ended by saying the different teams working on the app um, than the festival and the whole nine. So, yeah. (laughs) So it's basically the fire app and the icon festival is going to basically be the fire festival, just a different name and different teams involved. Okay, Ja. All right. Um, Moving right along. So let's keep breaking this mess down while looking at the management functions that I shared. Do you recall the four functions of management? If you said planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, then you are correct. So let's start with the first one. They failed at properly planning. Had they had a well-designed plan, then they would have picked dates that best aligned with the island's tourism and national events. They would have had a better timetable and even better McFarland. Um, would have had a better plan for his scheming, then he wouldn't have felt the push to rush the timetable to borrow from Peter to lie to Paul for more money, right? They should have planned for worst case scenarios. They should have planned for running out of money, bad weather, not having enough resources, not being able to get the island they desired, not having access to the travel and accommodations, medical emergencies, being stranded, not having food, not having adequate bathroom facilities, um, not having enough attendees to to, you know, meet their revenue goals, you know, and all of these things happened. And these are all the things they should have planned for. Had they planned for these things, then there would have been contingency plans in place and not the reactionary knee jerk back against the wall, idiotic decisions that were made as being contingency plans. You plan for the crap to hit the fan. You don't wait for it to happen and then try to figure out what to do. Second thing is they failed to organize properly. Had they done so, they would have had adequate financial, human, and physical resources. They would have had the money, time, labor, and facilities, food, and accommodations in place. They failed at leading. Um, No one with true experience was empowered to take over the management of this project, and no one with true experience was in place to lead others to succeed. In far as controlling, they failed there. Had they properly reported, tracked, and measured um, everything that was going on and their resources and their timelines, um, then everyone would have clearly seen that this was a disaster waiting to happen. And it wouldn't have taken, you know, months up to or weeks before or days before for them to have this aha moment. Imagine if they would have contacted festival goers two months before the event and said that they had issues clearing things with officials on the island. I mean, it's fluff talk, right? That's fluff talk. When you don't want to fully admit that you dropped the ball and plan properly, you use fluff talk. And that could have been fluff talk Um, because it's true, though. They hadn't fully cleared things. Right. But they could have said that and they could have told people who had already paid that their money could be refunded or applied to the later festival dates, which is something they ultimately offered when the festival blew up in their faces. So they could have done that two months prior. Heck, they could have even used the storm that hit as a delay tactic. They could have po- posted announcements and contacted attendees and said that due to the storm, there had been delays, damage, etc. And for the safety of attendees, they were going to postpone the event, you know, another four to six weeks from that date. But sadly, the first option wasn't feasible because McFarlane was already hemorrhaging the company and owed so much money that he probably couldn't sleep at night. So he didn't have wiggle room to postpone for months. However, he possibly could have pulled off the second option, which then would have given his event production crew the time that they needed to finish getting things in order and possibly begging enough artists to still show up. And that's a possibly. With my experience working in the music industry, I doubt it, but you don't know if you don't try. So what happened at Fire Festival is filled with business lessons that we can learn from. 
I actually dissect these lessons in greater detail in one of the business courses that my company, Foreman and Associates, offers. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, you can visit foremanllc.com backslash online course for details. Oh, woo, I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but I'm ready to switch gears and highlight some business owners who are doing positive things to bring a smile to your face. Are you ready for that? All right, then let's move past the fire festival Ugh, nonsense. And let's move on to some goodness and greatness. Now, did you know that after surgery, it's critical to have an experienced certified nursing assistant to provide round the clock care for the first 24 to 48 hours? Yep. Friends, spouses, and family are not medically equipped for the most part to provide this type of care. And without adequate aftercare, results may be compromised and healing may be delayed. And I know this for a fact because after I underwent a surgery in 2015, I should have had a CNA helping to care for me as it most likely would have saved me a trip to the emergency room and almost losing my life. Surgeries, no matter how minor you may think them to be, aren't anything to play around with. Well, the young woman that I'm about to introduce you to makes it her business to not only know this, but to provide her clients with the services that they need post-surgery. She started her business in 2012. And her client list has been growing ever since. We first met in April 2015 when I was the keynote speaker at her entrepreneurship graduation at Global Nonprofit Operation Hope. And she approached me after, gave me her card, and promised to remain in contact with me. And she's kept her word. From time to time, she even reaches out to me on social media. She's altered her business model slightly, focusing on a new niche, and I'm quite impressed with where she's going. I told her that I would be featuring her and her company on this podcast, and I'm keeping my word. Ladies and gentlemen, please meet Ms. Vinay Walters, the founder and CEO of Sacred Care Personal Care Services for patients who are receiving cosmetic surgery and understand the value of having aftercare to help with healing. And let me share the four um, package offerings that you can choose from. If you choose diamonds, you can have a CNA that's providing assistance to you three days and three nights at 72 hours. The pearls package is for 48 hours, that's two days and two nights, and the gems package is for 24 hours, that's one day and one night. You can also build your own package, and they can provide, um, they can monitor post-operative complications or provide you with drainage care, wound care, concierge services, right, where they can communicate with your doctor, staff, family, or friends. They um, can provide you with mobile care, specialist, personal care, which includes bathing, dressing, and grooming, Customized uh, meal planning, homemaking assistance, which is the light housekeeping and laundry, transportation services, lymphatic massages. Those are amazing. Um, pet care. I'm a dog owner. Like that would, you know, that's awesome. If you have pets, you know that they're your babies and you have to have someone help take care of them. Um, some other services they can offer are supplies management and overnight care. Now, with this, you have to have a medical doctor's referral. So your MD has to refer, um, make that referral to receive post-operative home care. To contact the sacred care team, you can reach them uh, by phone at area code 404-839-5696. Yeah, I don't know if I said earlier, they're in Atlanta, Georgia, 404-839-5696. You can also email them at info at sacredcare.com. Um, Their website is sacredcare.com. They're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. and Saturday, 12 to 4, and they're closed on Sunday. If you or a loved one is preparing for cosmetic surgery, contact Sacred Care to have them customize a post-surgery plan for you. Right now, I spoke to Ms. Walters a couple weeks ago, and she told me that they're offering a fall special, which is 50% off their consultation fee. So you have that bonus. They're also hiring qualified, motivated, and professional certified nursing assistants who reside in Georgia, have at least two years of experience in long-term care, nursing home, or hospital settings. Candidates must have a current CPR and first aid certifications, um, a negative TB test, and able to pass a national criminal background check. If this is you, send your resume and cover letter to sacredcareatl at gmail.com. To learn more about the organization, please visit their website at sacredcare.com. You can also follow them on Instagram at sacredcare, and it's the underscore. 
I am very proud of you, Miss Walters. Keep pushing, keep pressing, keep walking forward, keep praying. There will be rough times and good times, but know that they are all experiences to learn and grow from. Now, let me share a little about the next entrepreneur. I met him the same day as Miss Walters. He is a fashion designer and visual artist who paints abstract designs that are made into limited edition prints on fabrics. That night, he brought some of his designs to the entrepreneurship graduation. His mother beat him to the punch and quickly introduced herself to me, and then she introduced her son. Um, he draped a beautiful scarf around me that night and then showed me several ways to wear it. I ended up buying a few scarves from him that I absolutely love, love, love. And I was shocked to know that up to that time when I first met him, he had already been featured in New York and overseas in Hong Kong. And in 2010, his painting um, entitled As the Twig Bends, So the Tree Inclines was selected for permanent display in the National Russian Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. What? Yes. So who is this mystery man? I know you're wondering. Is none other than the extremely talented Cedric Brown. And he is the brilliance behind the company Cedric Brown Collections. Let me share more about Cedric. He received a bachelor's degree in fashion design from the Savannah College of Art and Design, commonly just known as SCAD. And as I mentioned earlier, he took part in Operation Hope's entrepreneurship program to hone his business skills. The night that we met, he asked me to support his efforts in any way that I could. And heck, after hearing his story and seeing his impressive work, I wanted to do something to help him. So I introduced him to a local boutique owner and I reached out to other businesses and influencers to embrace him and support his company. And of course, whenever I can shout him out on social media, I do. Over the years, Cedric and his company have been featured in Jezebel Magazine, Sheen Magazine, Voyage ATL, Impeccable Magazine, Young Black Entrepreneur Magazine, TheWeekender.com, and on various radio shows. Um, He's also been featured in the Birmingham Times, on CNN, Um, Atlanta Journal, Constitution, and more. So that's AJC. And his designs have been worn by local and international celebrities, influencers, and politicians, such as um, Wyclef Jean, Wale, Angie Stone, Birdman, and actresses Vivica Fox and Lynn Winfield, um, actress and singer um, Tamla Mann, Congresswoman Joyce um, Beatty, who represents Ohio's 3rd District, um, news anchor Jovita Moore in Atlanta, um, That's just to name a few. There's so many more. I couldn't fit them all in. Um, There are also a number of Fortune 500 CEOs who proudly rock his designs, such as Denny's CEO, John Miller, and Lowe's CEO, Marvin Ellison. He even has corporate clients such as um, MGM Resorts International, and that's in their Bellagio hotel brand. His line has been featured at the Essence Music Festival and in boutiques and events around the world. He shared his story and talents with children of all ages at career day um, events at schools in Atlanta, which I think is so awesome. And during the spring, he collaborated with United Way Atlanta and United Way of of Greater Atlanta, um, their young professional leaders group, to raise money for their home initiative program. And through sales on his online store, 25% would be donated to the home initiative program. Pretty cool, isn't it? Cedric's line has grown from scarves to also include men's neck ties and bow ties, kimonos, socks, pocket squares, and other accessories for men and women. His collections being sold in various stores and boutiques all over to include Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, and Tennessee. So let's help to expand his brand even further, right? We want to see him in stores all across the country and around the world. I want you guys to visit CedricBrownCollections.com to see his work, to make a purchase or two or 10. Um, or to even contact Cedric's team about getting his line into your store or featured at your event. So when you go to CedricBrownCollections.com, if you join their exclusive CBC club, you'll receive 15% off your next order, how to wear it tutorials, which are so helpful, and invitations to private sales. Be sure to follow him and his company on social media. He's on Instagram and Twitter at said 2 fresh that's C-E-D, the number two, fresh. His company can be easily found on Instagram at Cedric Brown Collections. That's Cedric, C-E-D-R-I-C, Brown Collections. You can also call them at area code 770-569-3914. That's 770-569-3914. If you love art and fashion, then you need to get your hands on Cedric Brown Collections. Can you tell I'm extremely proud of Cedric and honored to have an original Cedric Brown Collections scarf? Yes, I have. He's brilliant, he's talented and humble, 
anything that I can do to support Cedric and his business, I will. So make sure that you visit CedricBrownCollections.com today and purchase something special for you and someone you love. And if there's no one that you want to purchase a gift for, you can just send it to me. (laughs) Now, let me share the third entrepreneur with you. This man is Cedric Brown's cousin. And guess where I met him? Yep. At the entrepreneurship program graduation where I spoke in April 2015. He walked up to me, pitched his service offerings, and gave me his card. Interesting enough, I still have his card. I also have Cedric's and Miss Walters. If you need interior and or exterior painting, remodeling, pressure washing, sheetrock staining, framing, or other commercial or residential services, and you're in Metro Atlanta, then you should consider contacting Fountain and & Fountain and speak with their owner, Cartez Fountain. You can call them at area code 770-727-1553. That's 770-727-1553. You can also see a lot of their before and after photos on Instagram. Just go to Fountain and Fountain. They're updating, and that's spelled out, by the way. They're updating their website and building out an app with big plans to blend in tech to reach and serve more customers. So in the meantime, just connect with them via phone and social media. Ladies and gentlemen, Fountain and Fountain does great work at great rates. Check them out today. Once again, their phone number is area code 770-727-1553. Tell them you heard about their services on the Don't Call It Small Business podcast. Now, next up, if you have a car and you like it and you like for it to be clean and you don't want to be the one cleaning it, then I have a possible solution for you. They will clean your car if it's in the state of Georgia or anywhere across the country or even overseas. Yep, that's what they said. Um, they, um, they do note that there's increased rates per car per service and a visit will be applied for travel outside of the metro Atlanta area. And they also have a special rider terms and conditions that um, apply for any travel over 25 miles. Um, that includes out-of-state and international travel. But <clears throat> they're willing to travel. So whose company is this, right? Um, I know you're asking like, well, who is this? It's Victory Detailing Group. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia, and they're led by Tyrone DeBose. Tyrone connected with me a while back. I checked out his work and was impressed. And now months later, I'm glad to be featuring him and his company on this podcast and our social media feed. So let me tell you about Victory Detailing Group. Their car, they have um, car care club packages and various plans, which is really cool. You can select your plan on your first time. On the first time you work, you have them clean your car. They'll do so at a 20% discount. And right now they have a limited time offer for $129. Um, you, their package, you can get interior and exterior treatments. They have organic, earth-friendly, waterless detailing solution, which allows them to wash, polish, and protect your car all in one treatment. They have um, dashboard doors, door jams, sidewalls, interior carpets are deep vacuumed. Um, they do glass window, glass in the windows, cockpit, console, and cup holders are cleaned, which is always a big thing for me. I don't like it when they, people don't clean those. Um, they do upholstery um, in the seating clean, cleaned, and they condition them. Um, they do the tires and rims in this satin finish, this polished all by hand, the exterior body, they um, do with, with just amazing shine. I mean, amazing shine. And all treatments are carefully performed by hand, meticulously detailed to perfection. Um, and they also will include a free um, hand wax and free carpet shampoo. And their packages are recommended for in, um, if you want proper car wash maintenance, protection, and enhanced beauty. So they have these different packages. Their goal package is something that's weekly. You have four service visits per month. You save 30% and those rates start at $59 for a car, $69 for an SUV, and $79 if you have an extra, extra large, Um, you know, the XXL. Silver package is bi-weekly, so you get two services for um, a month. You save about 20%. That package starts off at $69 for a car, $79 for an SUV, $89 for XXL. Bronze package is one service visit per month. Um, You save 10%. That package starts at $79 for a car, $89 for SUV, $99 for uh, XXL. Victory Detailing Group does amazing work inside and out. When your car is important to you, then shouldn't you take 
it to someone who'll get take great care of it, right? Um, I just, yeah. I strongly recommend it. Consider allowing Victory Detailing Group to pamper your car, truck, or SUV this week. You're going to smile at that shine. I know it rained yesterday, folks, but hey, your car needs to be pampered and cleaned too, just like you. So if you're interested in learning more or getting started, visit victorydetailinggroup.com. You can call them now for priority service at area code 404 478-7878. That's 404-478-7878. You can follow Tyrone on Twitter and Instagram at calltyronenow. You can follow his company on Instagram at Victory Detailing Group. Tell him you heard about them on Don't Call a Small Business Podcast. And I'm telling you, you, if you're really interested in having that car done up, this is the time to do it. Uh Uh-oh, you know what this music means, right? (laughs) It's that time, folks. Time to wrap up and go on our separate ways until next week. If you have questions or suggestions about this show, please email them to don'tcallitsmallbiz at gmail.com. If you're not already following us on Instagram and Facebook, then please do. We can connect at Foreman and Associates and on Twitter at the number 4 man associates you can follow me on instagram at ms natasha foreman that's ms natasha foreman and on facebook twitter and linkedin at natasha l foreman thank you for tuning in sharing with others and for your continued support and don't forget what i tell you each and every episode don't call what you're planning thinking dreaming or doing little or small go big go bold or go nowhere I'll see you next week for episode 13 of Don't Call It Small. Have a super awesome day and week.